listening to One Lambda webinar today. My name is Peter Deep, the Antibody Detection Product Manager. We're very happy to have Dr. Annette Jackson back with us today. She is the Director of the Immunogenetics Laboratory and Associate Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University. She's previously presented with us on the opportunities and barriers associated with HLA mismatched HSCT. Today, she'll be talking about the role of non-HLA antibodies, providing a new perspective on allograft injury and rejection. It's now my pleasure to turn today's program over to our presenter, Dr. Annette Jackson. Thank you, Peter, um, and thank you everyone for, for calling in today. Um, it's my pleasure to kind of talk um, through the re a review of non-HLA antibodies and transplantation and in some of our experience in testing for these um, antibodies. Uh, so I will begin with a disclosure that the opinions that I will be um, expressing during my presentation are, are those of my own and not representative of the opinions of One Lambda Thermo Fisher, and that I am um, on the speaker, speaker bureau for One Lambda Thermo Fisher and we receive um, honoraria. So, so the, to begin at the beginning, um, I believe everyone on the call is, is well aware of well aware of the um, large body of literature suggesting um, that HLA-specific antibodies that have um, specificity for donor antigens have been shown to elicit injury to transplanted allografts. What, what is becoming um, a bigger wealth of literature is the identification of other non-HLA antibody targets that may also be involved in, in allograft injury. And that list continues to be growing, and this is only a partial list, I must admit. But it's similar to the iceberg in that HLA may, may just be the tip of the iceberg in looking at antibodies that are important in allo transplantation. And truly, um, the goal of all of our, ours is to extend the life of the transplanted allograft, given the um, the limitations in the, the limited resource of um, allograft organs. So a seminal article that was published by Opelt et al. in The Lancet um, back in 2005 that really changed our thinking about non-HLA sensitization was this uh, very large study in which they observed lower 10-year allograft survival in patients with a 50, greater than 50% CPRA compared to patients that had no detectable HLA antibody. And what was significant about this study is that it, um, the, patient, the transplants that were examined were over 4,000 HLA identical sibling renal transplants. And what this suggested was that sensitization to antigens outside of the HLA region may be important in long-term allograft survival. And that kind of began our journey into non-HLA antibody detection. Non-HLA antibody targets include both polymorphic and non-polymorphic antigens. Um, some are expressed on outside of the cell, ex extracellular proteins, um, such as MYC-A and AT1R receptor. Some are intracellular antibodies specific for Vimentin, um, as well as uh, matrix proteins have been um, published in the literature to be associated with allograft injury. We know from um, B cell biologists that um, through the ontogeny of B cells, uh, there are checkpoints in which autoreactive B cell receptors and B cell clones are removed from the B cell repertoire. And, but it's also recognized that um, that rare autoreactive B cells do exist in the periphery of even normal individuals. This is a figure taken from a beautiful review by Jennifer Zhang and Elaine Reed in Nature Reviews in Nephrology, um, in which it shows that upon endothelial cell damage of the transplanted allograft, autoantigens as well as alloantigens are released and it allows these rare autoreactive T cells and rare autoreactive B cells to become activated. And if there is a cognate interaction between an autoreactive T cell and B cell, um, there is the possibility of producing autoantibodies. And certainly the autoimmunity literature um, 
has a lot of uh, data to show that this does happen. So what, is a, what are the risk factors for developing non-HLA antibody in our transplant cohort? Um, certainly, uh, allograft damage can happen um, at times of infection um, and other forms of tissue injury, such as chronic end-stage or organ failure, um, during vascular surgery. Um, certainly, there's new literature coming out that heart transplant recipients are weightless patients who receive LVAD placements have a higher incidence of both HLA, development of HLA antibodies as well as non-HLA antibodies. Um, ischemic damage may release autoantigens and uh, calcineurin toxicity. And certainly, um, the alloimmune response due to HLA mismatches can also elicit tissue injury, which then may lead to non-HLA antibody formation. Um, this is data from Mohana Kumar's laboratory, um, which I thought was very interesting and, and needed to be highlighted. Um, they examined um, patients with end-stage lung failure, and when they assayed for the presence of non-HLA antibodies, specific for K-alpha tubulin and collagen-1 and collagen-5, they found that 23% of patients with native lung failure, these are not transplant patients yet, but with native lung failure, showed antibodies to these non-HLA targets. And those that had detectable non-HLA antibodies to these targets also showed elevated um, serum levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, suggesting that non-HLA antibodies can form even prior to transplant due to the um, end-stage organ failure. This is work from Tara Stigdell and Minnie Sarwell's lab in which they looked at sequential samples from patients that went on to develop chronic renal allograft injury. And the heat map on the right shows um, they used a protein array to look for non-HLA antibody formation and found very few patients were positive for non-HLA antibodies detected on this array at baseline. However, with increasing time post-transplant, you can see the heat map signal goes from blue to red red being the highest level of, of non-HLA antibodies. And so they identified certain non-HLA antibody targets that were enriched in this non-HLA antibody um, repertoire in, um, that was associated with chronic allograft injury. Um, more recently, the literature has shown that the release of donor extracellular vesicles, shown here, um, I've highlighted it in this figure from Zhang and Reed, um, may also be a, a mode of sensitizing patients to non-HLA antigens. These vesicles are released upon um, endothelial cell damage and then interact with the adaptive immune system. This is a, a 2015 paper from Dr. Eber from, from Canada in which they showed that exosomes released from um, injured and dying cells can express LG3, a, a byproduct of perlican, and induce autoantibody production. Um, they, they performed experiments in a mouse model in which they induced kidney is, uh, ischemia perfusion injury. So they clamp off the native kidney and show an increase in serum nanocal vesicles expressing LG3 LG3 on the cell surface two days post um, ischemic pre, pre, reperfusion injury. And again, this is in the native kidney of a mouse model. But really interesting is this lower panel, which shows that 14 days post injury, um, these animals begin making autoantibody to LG3, show, showing a direct cause and effect um, of injury and autoantibody production in these animal models. Mohana Kumar's lab has gone on to show that donor-derived exosomes coming from the allograft can also be coated with self-antigens. And these, this is um, research performed in human lung allograft recipients. Um, what these electron um, images show on the right is exosomes isolated from, from the serum of stable lung transplant patients 
um, did not express um, collagen or K-alpha tubulin on the surface of the exosome. But when exosomes were isolated from patients experiencing acute rejection, they did see evidence of collagen and K-alpha tubulin on the surface of these exosomes. They, they found similar findings in patients suffering from BOS, that the exosomes were coated with, the, with these self-antigens, um, suggesting that with damage that arises with acute rejection or chronic rejection, as in BOS, um, an increased number of exosomes are released into the patient's serum. They're coated with these non-HLA antigens, and then these exosomes serve as a sensitizing um, vehicle, if you will. So non-HLA antibody detection in the serum, um, it's often, testing for these non-HLA antibodies is often done at a single time point and is detection of non-HLA antibody in the serum of a patient undergoing acute rejection always indicative um, that the antibody is an active contributed injury? Or is detection of non-HLA antibody in a single time shot of patient sera uh, reflect a biomarker of past vascular injury? In other words, if you have a uh, lung transplant recipient who's having dysfunction post-transplant and you identify non-HLA antibodies even at high level in their serum, is that related to the acute injury that's occurring currently? Or did those non-HLA antibodies develop during end-stage organ failure when they um, lost their native lungs? And this is where we really need to be um, careful in how we interpret these tests when we're testing a single time point. In the follow, following slides, I, I'm going to try to provide evidence that um, there is evidence that these antibodies may be directly um, linked to acute, um, to active antibody injury. But again, I just wanted to highlight that, uh, that thought process with this slide, that we really need to be careful um, when we're uh, making associations from, from a single time point. So, um, Mohana Kumar has, has published a, a very large um, data set um, looking at the detection of antibodies to collagen-5 and K-alpha-1 tubulin in lung transplant recipients and shown that the uh, appearance of these antibodies do correlate with um, expression of fibrogenic growth factors and pro-inflammatory genes and um, suggesting that they do have a causal relationship with the development of BOS. Jessica Dragoon has, has been, uh, done seminal work in our understanding of anti-angiotensin II um, type 1 receptor antibodies. Um, her laboratory has shown that when you have um, AT1R antibodies, they can bind to the second extracellular loop of AT1R and actually activate, act as ligand and activate the, the receptor. Um, resulting in downstream signaling and downstream effector functions of this receptor. And certainly she published a seminal New England Journal of Medicine paper showing that patients with malignant hypertension did have high levels of AT1R antibody in their sera. Um, Mary Philogene from our laboratory has, has analyzed AT1R antibody levels and correlated them to rejection upon biopsy and has, um, in these whisker plots, she has shown that as the injury score increases on the biopsy, so do the AT1R antibody concentrations. Again, suggesting that the more antibody you have in your serum, the greater the injury on biopsy, suggesting a causal relationship. She found this type of linear relationship when she looked at um, high glomerular, glomerulitis scores, in, inflammatory scores, and peritubular capillary scores. Um, some of the biopsies had both non-AT1R and HLA antibody. The lower panels were biopsies that had no detectable HLA DSA, only AT1R antibodies. And you can see that the trend with increasing injury, with increasing AT1R antibodies um, held. There's been a lot of um, interesting work on antiperlican or LG3 antibodies and injury as well as transplant vasculopathy. In a, in a kidney transplant study, um, they showed that 
anti-perlican antibodies was associated with vascular rejection. And at the same time that they detected antibody in the serum, there was also increased levels of circulating LG3. And these um, patients had reduced allograft survival. Um, these same investigators went on to, to study this further um, in a mouse model to understand whether the anti-LG3 antibodies could be um, actively involved in injury. And they found that with passive transfer of the anti-LG3 antibodies into a mouse model of vascular rejection, they found an increase in neo-intimal formation, an increase in C4D staining on biopsy, and an increase in mononuclear infiltrate in animals that received the anti-LG3 antibody as compared to control animals. We began our work in um, investigating non-HLA antibodies um, with the rollout of the XM1 crossmatch in which we um, could use to detect donor-specific endothelial cell reactive antibody. And for those of you that do not perform this test, um, it's a very simple crossmatch test. You isolate TI2 posit positive donor-specific endothelial cell precursors from the donor blood using magnetic beads. You add patient serum and an anti-IgG fluorescent antibody, and then look for a, a shift above neg negative control serum. And this was a, a multi-center multi clinical trial performed in, a, in the early 2000s in which uh, it was a blinded control study in which we did endothelial cell cross matches prior to transplant. The clinicians were blinded to the results. And in this multicenter trial, we found that patients that were transplanted across a positive endothelial cell crossmatch with their donor had a much higher incidence of acute rejection in the very early um, weeks and months post-transplant. And the, the rejection was much higher than those patients transplanted across a negative endothelial cell crossmatch. Interestingly, um, although we were detecting donor-specific antibody in these crossmatch tests, um, the vast majority of these rejections did not appear as typical antibody-mediated rejection, but in fact were C4D negative on biopsy. We were interested in, in, in why this was so, so we went on to perform IgG subclass analysis of these non-HLA antibodies. And when we looked at the subclass of antibodies bound to these endothelial cell precursors, we found that they were enriched for IgG2 and IgG4 which are not known to activate complement well. And this is in comparison to HLA antibodies, which are known to be enriched for IgG1, 2, and 3. We did have um, one case report in which a patient had lost multiple um, live donor kidney transplants um, in a very rapid, hyperacute type of rejection in the absence of detectable complement activation. Um, this patient had received two previous transplants at another center. Um, both were live donor transplants. There was no HLA sensitization detected in the patient's sera. Both transplants were lost within hours of transplant. Uh, the biopsy on day one and day two following um, the rejection process showed strong polymerulitis, vasculitis, and peritubular capillaritis, all suggestive of AMR but in both biopsies um, were C4D negative. The patient presented at Johns Hopkins for his third live donor transplant. He had now become broadly sensitized to HLA with a CPRA of 94%. We were able to identify a kidney, um, through kidney pair donation, an exchange donor to which he had no HLA antibody. Um, however, he tested positive in an endothelial cell crossmatch prior to transplant. Um, the, the decision uh, was made to move forward with the transplant using rituximab and uh, ciclizumab as induction agents and to do one session of plasmapheresis prior to transplant. The kidney functioned immediately within the OR, but within 12 hours of, of, of the surgery, his urine output uh, dropped precipitously and he was aneuric by end of day. Um, if you might recall, this was the exact same scenario as it was his previous two live donor transplants. 
He immediately started daily plasmapheresis, low-dose IVIG. He was given eculizumab, the C5 complement inhibitor, to stop any complement-activated injury. Um, he did not improve with these two um, th therapeutics. He was, uh, splenectomy was performed on day three, and he was also started on abortizumab and thymoglobulin um, regimen. As I mentioned, on day one is when his urine output began to fall. His day two biopsy showed um, evidence of possible early AMR. His uh, biopsy on day three showed um, increasing injury. That is when the rescue splenectomy was performed, which I might add, splenectomy and eculizumab have saved every early AMR uh, here at Johns Hopkins. So the fact that his urine output did not improve um, was very troublesome after the rescue splenectomy. On day 12, another repeat biopsy was performed. Um, this showed extensive congestion and hemorrhage and extensive endothelial cell injury. On day 18, the patient was, um, was losing blood and an aspirectomy was performed. And the final bi um, diagnosis was a vascular rejection of 2B. So this is a case in which um, throughout the entire process, we detected no HLA DSA, but we continued to um, detect endothelial cell reactive antibody. Um, the spleen, a uh, portion of the spleen was brought to our laboratory, and we isolated splenic B cells and put them into culture. We added um, CD40 ligand as long, along with um, the necessary cytokines that are needed for plasma cell differentiation, and we cultured the cells for 21 days. Um, the histogram shows um, the increased number of CD138 or plasma cells um, post-culture compared to pre-culture. We then assayed the antibody in the culture supernate, and we found that it was negative for HLA DSA on our Luminex beads, but, it, but the supernate tested positive in an endothelial cell cross match, suggesting that the active um, B cell immune response that was occurring in this patient during the active rejection of the kidney allograft um, did involve a non-HLA antibody target. We were curious to identify um, what these endothelial cell antibody targets um, were, and so in a collaboration with Tara Sigdell and Mindy Sarwal, we, um, we isolated um, these anti-endothelial cell antibodies um, by eluding them off of the TIE 2 positive cells, and then assayed them on a protein array containing over 9,000 human proteins. Um, we identified four endothelial cell proteins um, expressed on the cell surface and published this in JSON. Um, all four of these antigen targets uh, did play a role in um, transmigration of cells across the endothelial cells. We were also um, interested in, in whether these endothelial cell reactive antibodies um, had a, their mechanism of, of uh, injury. We, again, isolated endothelial cell reactive antibodies by eluding them off of the TIE 2 positive endothelial cell precursors and used them to stimulate primary endothelial cell cultures. We then looked at surface expression of different adhesion molecules as well as, as well as HLA and found that endothelial cell cultures that were activated with these antibodies showed an increase in adhesion molecules E-selectin and ICAM-1. And these antibodies also, in their activation of endothelial cells, upregulated HLA expression. Um, stimulation with these antibodies also caused the primary endothelial cell cultures to upregulate um, the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And um, this bar graph shows the cytokines produced from these endothelial cell cultures when um, stimulated with eluates, or these non-HLA endothelial cell reactive antibodies that we elute from the endothelial cell precursors, um, compared to cultures activated with um, TNF-alpha or HLA-specific antibodies as our positive control. And you can see that these endothelial cell antibodies were very good at stimulating pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as RANTES and resistance. And in fact, 
they activated endothelial cell cultures even better than the TNF-alpha positive control or HLA antibodies known to react with the HLA on these endothelial cell cultures, um, suggesting that these endothelial cell antibodies may not be um, real efficient in activating complement, but they're activating endothelial cells and recruiting um, the patient's immune uh, immune cells in perhaps in a different fashion through these pro-inflammatory cytokines. So I think the job of us in the laboratory is how to identify clinically relevant HLA and non-HLA antibodies. And, and just in a, in a simple table, I can, I can say that similar to HLA antibodies, I think non-HLA antibodies that are detected at high titer um, may be more clinically relevant. Um, those that develop de, um, de novo or post-transplant may be of a higher affinity and more threatening to the allograft. Some non-HLA antibodies have been shown to be um, efficient in complement activation. Um, there are papers out showing that MIC-A antibodies are quite efficient in activating complement. And finally, I think we have to um, also open our mind to the fact that there may be complement independent mechanisms in which non-HLA antibodies can elicit allograft injury. Um, this is work um, by Mohan Kumar's lab again, looking at de novo non-HLA antibody production. And they found in heart transplant recipients that um, DSA detection occurred early, followed by MIC-A detection with AMR onset occurring following that. And the same progression of DSA development followed by antimyosin, antivimentin, and then AMR um, seem to be a common, common story. And whether de novo non-HLA antibodies um, pose a greater threat than those detected prior to transplant is still um, being investigated. These same investigators also found that de novo non-HLA antibodies correlated with increased incidence of acute rejection and vasculopathy. Um, interestingly, um, Mohana Kumar's lab has also shown that, that CD4 T cells can also be found within transplant patients and have specificity to myosin and, and vimentin. Um, so this may not only be an antibody-mediated injury, um, but these targets may also elicit T cells mediated injury. This is um, work done in uh, Driska Dragoon's lab, again with the thought of could de novo um, AT1R antibodies and ETAR antibodies be more deleterious. Um, the bottom graph shows detection of um, these antibodies in AMR positive with the black line or AMR negative, the dotted line, patient. And you can see while both AMR positive and negative patients had similar levels um, of antibody prior to transplant. It's those that um, either persisted, their antibodies persisted or developed post-transplant that had the higher incidence of AMR. And this was both for ETAR as well as AT1R antibodies. This is um, work from um, Taniguchi et al. And what I wanted to point out with this slide, and this has also been shown by Nancy Reinsmoor and colleagues from Cedar sinai is that um, graft sur survival um, is best when neither HLA-DSA nor AT1R antibodies were detected in the patient's sera, that there was lower graft survival in patients with anti-AT1R alone or DSA alone. However, in a small cohort of patients in which both non-HLA and HLA DSA were identified, those patients had the worst prognosis. And so we have to um, think about how these antibodies may work in synergy. Certainly, our, our work in the endothelial cell reactive antibodies showed that these antibodies can activate the endothelium and perhaps upregulate HLA. Perhaps that's when um, low-level HLA DSA becomes more harmful as the level of HLA expression on the allograft endothelium increases. Certainly, um, these non-HLA antibodies may be in, involved in um, vascular um, uh, proliferation of smooth muscle cells 
and chronic injuries uh, detected in heart transplantation. They've been shown to associate with apoptosis and complement activation. And some non-HLA antibodies have been linked to pro, um, pro-thrombotic um, diseases. Um, as I mentioned, there is some evidence that allograft injury may be due to synergy between both HLA and non-HLA antibodies. Whether this is due to the fact that you, you need a certain threshold of antibody before mediating injury, or whether um, um, some of the non-HLA antibodies or the HLA antibodies induce endothelial cell um, activation and an upregulation of antigen density on the cell surface, which then can um, add to increased injury. Um, I wanted to point out that work with um, Mini Sarwell's laboratory, um, and we have identified additional um, polymorphic variants outside the HLA regions that correlate with antibody mediated rejection. And this was identified through exome sequencing of recipient and donor pairs. This is a heat map showing that certain variants were um, enriched in patients with AMR, um, shown here in the top red bar. Um, other variants were enriched in patients uh, experienced cell-mediated rejection, and there were the least um, variant differences in patients with no rejection. And this um, article is in Press and Frontiers Immunology. And finally, in closing, um, when Lambda is working on a Luminex-based non-HLA antibody panel, and um, we have done a little bit of beta testing of this in our laboratory, we tested approximately 40 sera from patients with kidney patients with no rejection or, or dysfunction, and 40 patients that did have rejection on biopsy along with dysfunction. We looked at both early rejections and late rejections. Um, and this is a heat map, red being a positive antibody response and um, white being no reactivity whatsoever. And um, we did find that there was more positive beads in our rejection cohort compared compared to our non-rejection cohort. Um, some beads were, appeared to be more informative, and, and what I have highlighted here in pink shows that um, these three beads, for instance, tend to have higher antibody reactivity in our rejection cohort than our non-rejection cohort. Um, uh, two of the beads that I'm highlighting here with my, my arrow seem to be um, strongly reactive in both cohorts and not, not as informative. Um, this is another um, set of, of, of beads that, again, we, sh we showed higher reactivity in our rejection cohorts than our non-rejection cohorts. Um, these non-HLA B panels are complex, and we're just um, doing more testing. I, I, we're going to have to really um, produce a lot, of, uh, a lot of data in which we correlate our detection of non-HLA antibodies using um, luminex speed panels and um, correlate them to outcome and, and, and injury on biopsy as our, our gold standard. Um, so I believe there's a lot of work to be done. Currently, there are very few tests in which we can use in, in our clinical laboratories to detect the presence of non-HLA antibodies. And so I think um, the creation of non-HLA antibody Luminex B panels is really a breakthrough in, in our ability to detect these antibodies and generate some clinical correlates. Um, in fact, the 2017 BAMF um, update paper suggests that for rejection on biopsy in the absence of antibody-mediated rejection in the absence of um, detectable HLA DSA they recommend testing for non-HLA antibodies. And so it's really important that we expand our tool set in the ability to detect non-HLA antibody in the sera of our transplant recipients. Um, I also advocate for serial testing, testing patients both prior to transplant and at time of dysfunction, even if that um, testing of the pre-transplant sample occurs retrospectively. Um, it is useful to look at whether the non-HLA antibody you're detecting at time of biopsy and dysfunction was present prior to transplant. And so um, in closing, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues both at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Philogene and Donna Lucas, who um, did all of the non-HLA bead panel work, um, as well as my 
um, pathologists and nephrologists and transplant surgeons, um, Bob Montgomery, who is now at NYU, and my collaborators at UCSF, Tara Mini, Sylvia, and Marina. Thank you very much, and I, I would like to um, answer any questions that may have arisen. Hi, Dr. Jackson. Hi. Um, thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for that um, excellent presentation. Um, I always really appreciate your extensive um, literature review in um, your talks, and that was um, uh, an excellent review of all the papers out there currently. So um, we'll open it up to the questions now, and we have our first one actually from um, Dr. Neng Yu, um, who's the director at uh, the American Red Cross in um, Dedham, Massachusetts. Um, the question is, should we incorporate screening non-HLA antibody to the wait list? Um, that's a great question. Um, I would like to give another shout out to Dr. Philogene in our laboratory who has just had a paper accepted in human immunology in which she asked that very same question, who, who should we be um, monitoring for these non-HLA antibodies? Um, Mary did find an increased incidence of um, non-HLA antibodies in patients with um, previous transplants. So uh, that is something um, that makes sense. And I, uh, so we recommend testing patients with previous transplants. Certainly anyone, um, as in the case study that I presented, who had um, very rapid accelerated rejection of previous allografts with no known function, you know, no known DSA, in, in, an, in a, an aggressive rejection of a transplanted allograft, they should perhaps bubble up on the list as someone that you should do preemptive testing. Um, I, I think uh, our, true, our full understanding of, of non-HLA antibodies and when they are deleterious and when they may just be a reflection of previous injury and maybe not be a high, tighter high affinity and be injurious to an incoming allograft is, is still a bit uncertain. So I, I'm not sure I would be really ready to advocate um, not going to transplant with a patient with non-HLA antibodies. I don't think the data is strong enough for that. However, um, the only incidence would be in a patient who has um, historic repeated um, rapid rejection of an allograft. Um, in those patients, they probably do require a little more pre-screening to identify what the antibody is and whether it could be um, circumvented. Um, but we are not screening all of our pre-transplant patients um, on our wait list. We are screening preemptively all of our higher risk transplants, so all of our regrafts or patients for whom are very broadly sensitized, and we plan to transplant across DSA using our um, desensitization strategy using therapeutic trans um, plasmapheresis and low-dose IVIG. So our high-risk transplants, we are pre-protocol pre, um, testing for non-HLA antibodies, but not our low-risk patients nor our waitlist candidates, unless there's something about the waitlist candidates that um, makes us believe they're high-risk. Good. Um, thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, another question uh, came in uh, from Helen Ma. Um, are any of the antigens polymorphic or are they monomorphic and therefore not donor-specific for these non-HLA antibodies? Yeah, that's a, a big question. Um, they seem to be a mix. So we know that MCA antibodies are polymorphic and therefore could be allo. Uh, could be considered an allo antibody. Um, we know that at least some of the antibodies we're detecting in our endothelial cell crossmatch appear to be polymorphic because when we test a, a patient that tests positive in the endothelial cell crossmatch, when we test them across multiple surrogate donors, they're often reactive with some but not all donors. Um, and so, some are polymorphic. Certainly the antigens that we identified with that recent exome sequencing project um, with Mini Sarwal 
th those specifically are um, non-HLA polymorphic proteins that differed between the recipient and donor. So I have to say both. Um, Vimentin, tubulin, collagen, um, AT1R, and perlican are not known to be polymorphic. Um, so we do know that some patients from the autoimmunity literature can develop high titered IgG, high affinity antibody to certain autoantigens. And so um, I, we have to believe that that's what we're detecting in some of these um, non-HLA assays is IgG antibody to autoantigens that somehow have broken our self-tolerance to those autoantigens. And then you have to look at whether those antigens are expressed on the transplanted allograft. Are they expressed only during times of um, injury or inflammation? Um, and is their level of expression that significant enough to form enough antigen targets that it would cause an, um, allograft injury? And all of that still needs to be investigated both the antigen expression on the allograft as well as um, related injury, what, what, what affinity of antibody, autoantibody is required, what, what titer of autoantibody is required to elicit injury on the allograft. And I think we need more studies in where we're correlating non-HLA antibodies detected in serum and injury on biopsy. Okay, great. So um, is our titer something that you'll be trying to look at for non-HLA antibodies then in your own research, um, levels that might be um, impactful? Yes. And certainly, um, I think as an example, the AT1R antibody literature is, is a fine example. People, um, different labs have set different thresholds based on their clinical correlates. Um, I believe most laboratories are using 17 units um, as their positive threshold. Um, however, the literature is different. Um, I believe the Taniguchi paper where they looked at allograft loss um, used a 12 unit um, threshold. I need to go back to see if it was 12 or 15. But um, depending on what clinical correlate you use, may change the threshold for positivity. Um, and so that is something that we also need to publish more in the literature and, um, and look at a meta-analysis of all published literature and come up with what is the best threshold, um, both for AT1R as well as um, endothelial cell cross-match, the, the XM1 cross-match, and certainly as these new non-HLA Luminex beads are released. Um, we're going to need to correlate um, the characteristics of the antibody, both the um, titer, meaning um, doing serum dilutions and retesting and seeing if the antibody remains positive, um, and maybe performing IgG subclass analysis and um, looking at whether the non-HLA antibody is increasing post-transplant, so is there evidence of de novo generation of non-HLA, or was the antibody detected at same level prior to transplant? All of these different characteristics need to be um, put together and, and correlated to injury on biopsy and correlated to um, dysfunction and allograft loss in order for us to really um, identify what is a clinically relevant non-HLA antibody. And I don't think we're there yet. I think we need more data in the literature to be able to come to a consensus and develop guidelines for um, who, should be, who should be tested, how often patients should be tested, and what um, designates a possibly um, injurious non-HLA antibody. Right, so it'll take a, a quite a bit more tracking over time. Once you've established a baseline, it's it's just going to take that monitoring, right? Yeah, because I believe um, some of the newer work, um, definitely from Diska and, and Mohana Kumar's laboratory, suggested that perhaps um, not de novo non-HLA antibodies that develop post-transplant may be more deleterious, and and that makes sense. We know that de novo HLA antibodies can be more deleterious. They they probably um, they may have 
higher affinity um, uh, because the patient is constantly being exposed to that alloantigen. And perhaps in a smoldering post-transplant immune response, you generate more higher affinity antibodies. And perhaps that is what will dictate the most deleterious non-HLA antibody. And so um, serial testing and better characterization of these non-HLA antibodies, and again, I, I said it 59 times already, but correlating to injury on biopsies and other gold standards of injury are really needed um, for us to develop a, um, an algorithm for identifying clinically relevant non-HLA antibodies. Mm -hmm. Certainly everyone on the call knows that we're still struggling with identifying a clinically relevant um, HLA, a donor-specific antibody, um, across the different organ groups. And so I think um, we know how much work that is, and we need to start doing that type of work in the non-HLA antibody um, arena. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, we have a, uh, another question from Asma Morkid. Um, they're asking, in their hospital, in their hospital, they only rely on HLA antibody screening and ha haven't really looked at non-HLA antibodies. And they're wondering if um, they transplant their patients with no problems, if that's, that's okay, or if it would be necessary to start looking at non-HLA antibodies. And I think you've already alluded to it, but um, if you can um, respond to that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, all centers have these rare cases in which they have a what appears to be an antibody-mediated rejection or antibody-mediated injury in the absence of HLA DSA. And whenever we get a post-transplant sample correlated to a, a rejection, in particular a possible AMR, the first thing we test for is HLA DSA. We rule out that first, and then we go to the non-HLA antibody testing. So it's really a dialogue between us and our transplant clinicians. Um, as I mentioned, we're only um, screening prior to transplant, those patients that we believe are at risk, um, broadly sensitized patients, patients with previous allografts, or patients with a history of rapid accelerated rejection. Um, otherwise, it's a, it's a for-cause only testing. If, um, and certainly our, our pathologists pointed out to our clinicians probably more often than we do. If our uh, Renal patholo transplant pathologists um, see an antibody-like injury on the biopsy, and they see that our HLA DSA tests are completely negative. Our pathologists actually initiate the conversation that perhaps we should investigate or test for non-HLA antibody. So it's really um, a decision that we have developed here at Johns Hopkins as a dialogue between us, the HLA lab, our transplant clinicians, our nephrologists, our cardiologists, our pulmonologists, and our pathologists as, as being the third um, player in, in this kind of decision making. Um, I think you need to get together and when you see injury in the abs antibody injury in the absence of HLA DSA, um, then you probably should be testing for non-HLA antibodies. Um, so that's how we have moved forward in our, our center is a collaborative effort between these three parties. And on their end, I mean, what does it look like to you? There, is there a strong um, interest in, in this arena um, from what they're seeing? Yeah, definitely. Um, here at Johns Hopkins, we've always had a really strong um, collaborative um, relationship with our transplant clinicians and our pathologists. And so um, if we see antibody injury on biopsy, the, both the clinicians as well as the pathologists want to know where is that antibody injury coming from? You know, is it recurrent glomerular disease? Um, you know, IgA nephropathy, you know, they, they're always looking for what is the mechanism of injury. And so our non-HLA antibodies just testing just provides one, one tool in the toolkit. They're definitely um, standing for other recurrent, you know, they're looking for recurrent disease as well as other um, antibodies that they may not be able to stain for in the pathology lab. And so um, it's engaging in your clinicians to let them know that um, non-HLA antibody testing is available, at least in very limited form currently, but, but hopefully 
um, as these Luminex bead panels roll out, it'll be much more accessible for any lab that runs a Luminex platform. Um, and then uh, we're going to have to start testing. But, but let me tell you, this is a complex arena, this non-HLA um, antibody uh, arena. And so um, I think to think that you're going to be able to run a non-HLA antibody panel and be able to give them definitive yes, an antibody is detected and that is the injurious, that's the antibody causing the injury, I don't think it'll be that simple. As I mentioned, some patients um, develop these non-HLA antibodies even prior to transplant. And so their detection post-transplant, they could be a biomarker of previous injury or a biomarker of active injury. And so um, all of that has to be sorted out. Um, and that's why looking at serial time points um, it may be important for helping that diagnosis as to whether the non-HLA antibody you're detecting at, in, at time of dysfunction may be um, actively involved. Because once we report the presence of an antibody, the clinician has to decide, now what do I do? Do I treat it? And so that's why we need to be very careful. Certainly, um, antibody reduction therapies do not have, you know, are not without risk or cost. And so um, we, we, as laboratorians, have to develop a rigorous um, studies showing uh, when is a non-HLA antibody um, linked to active injury. And perhaps those non-HLA antibodies should be treated. Um, and it's really up to the laboratory to produce this data and in collaboration with our clinicians correlate it to injury and dysfunction and really um, pound out what the characteristics of a non-HLA antibody are that uh, cause a greater likelihood that, that it may be involved in active injury and that it should be treated or removed, in other words. So I think a lot of work is needed um, in that arena um, before the um, protocol, you know, just everyone doing testing for these non-HLA antibodies and being able to um, recommend what the clinicians should do with this data. Um, certainly, we have to, if we're going to start testing a lot of patients and we're going to start charging, um, these tests have to come with a recommendation and an interpretation and, and value in um, improving the, the transplant success for our patients and the long-term allograft survival. We have another question from um, Hassan Mahmoud. Um, should I test these antibodies in the concept of complement and non-complement fixing or not? Very interesting question. Yeah, and I mentioned um, our work in the endothelial cell reactive antibodies um, that we detect in the XM1 crossmatch suggests that they're not, they're not um, really good at activating complement. Um, we showed that they were of subclasses that are not um, super efficient in active, uh, complement activation, but I also wonder if some of the targets are also at low level, uh, if the antigen targets are expressed at low level and therefore you don't get sufficient um, um, antibody density on the cell surface to activate complement. It could be um, both things play into activate, uh, activating complement. Um, you know, you have to have two IgG molecules closely um, juxtaposed to, to bind C1 and begin the complement cascade, so both antibody titer as well as antigen expression density um, both play into whether these non-HLA antibodies may activate complement. The same thing holds for non-HLA, for HLA-specific DSA, you have to have sufficient antigen expression as well as antibody titer to activate complement. So um, I think the non-HLA antibodies are going to be a mixed bag. I think some of them will activate complement, and certainly there, there are articles out showing that MIC-A antibodies can activate complement, um, but others may not activate complement well, and they may trigger the downstream injury due to um, non-complement pathways. Um, and certainly, Duska Dragoon's work in looking at AT1R antibodies activating the AT1R receptor um, is a non-complement um, mode of antibody injury and endothelial cell activation. So I don't think we can be as simplistic as a non-HLA antibody is only deleterious. 
when it activates complements. And certainly our, the case study I presented today, um, none of the biopsies from any of those acceleratedly rejected kidney allografts showed any evidence of complement deposition. So um, we do know that injury can occur in the absence of complement activation, although complement activation is the worst form of injury. Um, so I think we have to be open to multiple mechanisms of injury. Um, and we're going to be wrapping up pretty soon, but we have a, another question here um, uh, before we uh, finish today. Um, this question is coming from Victoria Robertson, and she asks, could there be scope for a flow-based assay blocking these non-HLA antigens on donor cells to assess their contribution to flow cross-match positivity? Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so I can tell you with our work with the XM1 cross-match that um, the, the antigens that we're detecting antibodies toward in the endothelial cell cross-match do not appear to mirror what we see in a lymphocyte flow cross-match. Um, so these, the endothelial cell antigens that we identified um, in the sera of patient with positive endothelial cell cross-matches um, are not known to be expressed on lymphocytes. But um, we, we have all experienced in our laboratories many, many positive lymphocyte flow cross-matches in which there's no HLA DSA to, to the donor cells. And so um, whether, whether the non-HLA antibodies we are detecting in our lymphocyte cross-matches could be deleterious to long-term allograft survival. We know our experience here at Hopkins is that uh, a positive lymphocyte cross-match due to autoantibodies it has not been linked to hyperacute rejection or even accelerated rejection. But whether those autoantibodies contribute to long-term allograft loss, um, we do not know. More subtle chronic forms of injury, we do not know. Um, certainly, I, I think the literature is still holding that IgM antibodies, whether they be directed toward HLA or non-HLA, may not be as deleterious. And that may be simply that um, IgM antibodies are, are normally categorized as low affinity because they have not undergone somatic hypermutation through a germinal cell reaction. Um, reaction. And so um, perhaps I'm less um, convinced that IgM antibodies are as clinically relevant as IgG antibodies, but um, I think there's a lot, a lot to be discovered on what, what is causing those positive lymphocytes flow cross matches and are those antibodies deleterious over a long run and that may require the collaboration of labs that do that routinely do auto um, cross matches or um, even allo cross matches in which there's no detectable HLA DSA um, and that that may take a collaborative um, between laboratories to pool data and pool outcome data and see is a positive flow cross match in the absence of detectable HLA DSA um, indicative of a poor long term outcome or increased um, rejection incidence, whether it be cell mediated or antibody mediated rejection? Um, I don't think that's been looked at in, in a good cohort. And I would also argue, again, that, that I am biased that. IgG antibodies may be more deleterious than IgM, so we have to make sure that we're not detecting IgM in our flow cross matches. We have to make sure that we're not, in those types of cross matches, we're not detecting IgG complexes bound to FC receptors on B cells. That may, you know, that could cause a false positive lymphocyte cross match. Um, so there's, we have to make sure that when we say there's no HLA DSA, that we're using rigorous methods to remove prozone and, and serum interference, and so that we're, we know that our HLA DSA call for those cross matches are, are clear and firm. Um, and so I think if done in a rigorous way, there could be a lot of um, information gained from looking at IgG positive donor flow cross matches in the absence of HLA DSA. Um, you know, what is the outcome of those transplants? I think it's an excellent question, and it has not been done well. 
Yeah, that that appears to be just it's going to require tracking and just to measure that long-term outcome, that potential for chronic rejection then. Um, <clears throat> but um, thank you very much um, for your presentation today, Dr. Jackson, and um, taking all these uh, questions. Everything's been so informative. And thank you to everybody out there who joined us today. We hope that you found this webcast presentation informative. Um, that concludes our webcast. Thank you again for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for, again. Thank you, Peter, and happy Valentine's Day, everybody.